coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here bringing you another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. I'm joined, as always, by mm, mm, muscly <laughs> Max Montana. And I, say that, I, was, I saw him doing some T-bar rows yeah. out in the garage earlier today, so he's got a full pump on for the episode, yep. in case you couldn't tell. So zoom in here, Shorty. Zoom in on that. <laughs> Photoshop <laughs> a vein down there for me. Old cock arms Ada. <laughs> and our guest today, uh, weightlifting coach extraordinaire, Mr. Sean Waxman. Sean, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. So Sean's got a long history as a, a lifter and a coach in USAW, coached a lot of very strong athletes, uh, had you know, kind of a unique position. Um, you know, one of the first times that, that Max and I probably hung out very much was at the Cloca Villa mm-hmm. seminar oh, yeah. back in the day yeah. for this unique position dealing with with foreign athletes and foreign coaches. So we're excited to talk to him about uh, you know his coaching pedigree, some of his thoughts on how this information from you know foreign lifting systems can be utilized, and some ideas about long term development, long term planning for athletes. So let's just go ahead and uh, and jump right into it. So, Sean, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, for the people who aren't familiar with you, your history as a lifter, uh, you know, how you came to be a coach and some of your influences as a coach? Uh, my lifting career was uh, fairly uneventful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was okay. Uh, I got into it actually to become a strength coach. I wanted to learn. I, I decided early on that the snatch or clean and jerk was the thing that I wanted to base my training of athletes on and uh and all the exercises that that lead up to developing it so i said well i'm gonna i'm an immersive kind of guy so if i want to learn something just throw myself into it and i said i'm gonna i want to be a i'll be a weightlifter so i can learn and then i'll use those skills to become to use it in strength and conditioning so that's how i kind of started in weightlifting but what uh, age was that <sighs> well made that decision probably 22 20 22, 23. Oddly enough, though, just before that, what, the, the, my introduction to weightlifting at all, the movements themselves, was through physical therapy. I had a Rob Panarello was my physical therapist uh, for my shoulder. My shoulder done in college, and the like the the bridge between therapy and actual play. Uh, the exercises we use we use more dynamic exercises. One of them being the the, the power clean. So I, was, I had a physical therapist actually teach me how to do a power clean. Huh. And uh, he was a strength coach for the Giants. I mean, he was uh, uh, under Johnny Parker. So he was like, a, he knew what he was doing. And so that was actually my first introduction to weightlifting. And then I real, then I, the more I learned, the more I realized that I wanted to use weightlifting. And I became a weightlifter and, and uh, competed from like 93, uh, or nine, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, ninety two, ninety three to two thousand one. I think it was after I re- after that. I it was that was it for me. I wasn't gonna get any better, um, and I was gonna kill myself. I think if I if I continued. <laughs> so uh, uh, I I trained with Bob Decano only, and throughout my career, and it was interesting experience. We both are bio majors, and uh, so he was really generous with his time with me, as far as learning coaching and science of coaching and so uh and the training was uh we trained every day six days a week uh, 48 weeks a year um i don't i think i missed i don't know nine days of training in in eight years so it was and it was i mean brutal i wouldn't recommend that kind i mean he's changed since then but it was really i mean you i've talked to max about it uh, you know, squatting every day, multiple times a day sometimes. Um, it taught me how to, uh, well, it taught me how to be a level of tough, a level of toughness that I didn't know that I had. Uh, and, 
but the, the biggest value that I got from that is the conversations with Bob. Mm -hmm. uh, I would show up an hour before training, our scheduled training, and he was training high school athletes. And he, he, and he allowed me to come and watch and ask and observe. And, 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 and so that to me, like I had, like I was almost like a, like a PhD in sports science. So I did that nearly every day, you know, Monday through Friday. And um, I really am grateful f for that. Uh, so what is uh, what is Bob's uh, uh, who were his mentors where was his official kind of so you know like back in his day there wasn't really coaches right. that much so like Bob Heist the third like the uh, okay. old man Heist for, who started Maverick Barbell Tommy Kono was his idol obviously because right. they're both Japanese uh, but, but I don't know if he had a, a coach other than I, I think Bob Heist the third but I'm I, but don't, don't quote me on that. Sure, sure. Uh, but back then, a lot of those guys, they looked at strength and health, and they said, "Oh, there's the clean. I'm, it's like three pictures, and I'm going to try to do that." There was no. I mean, we have the we have the luxury of, of of the digital age. Yeah. But those guys didn't. So I don't. I, a lot of those guys are self taught. So where where do you think Bob developed his his kind of strategy and and system of training from? So Bob was so from my understanding bob was very heavily uh russian influence right. early on like everybody else so they were really the only ones that were doing anything uh right. sports science wise i don't know and then i think that the biggest one of the biggest uh events that affected his trajectory was his time he spent in bulgaria with Abajaev. right so he went well, i don't know how, he went on a tour with i think usaw set it up at the time couple weeks I think and he had to spend time with Abajayev and and I think that really changed altered his perception of what the human body could do right not I don't know if he actually realized that those weren't really humans <laughs> <laughs> that, that were going through that one but, no asterisk there <laughs> right so he didn't know we, we didn't train Bulgarian style yeah. as far as singles to max all the time right but the volume that we did, I think he, he, he said, you know, I, there's a, we have to elicit a certain amount of stress to the human sure. organism in order to force change. And his philosophy was, this is the volume that's going to, that's going to do it either. And this is what I think was, this is a very Bulgarian uh, approach. He says, well, those that can do it are going to be great. Yeah. Those that aren't, you know, maybe you'll be good or maybe you, you, you'll be done. So I think that mentality of this is what it takes, yeah. and I'm going to find the athlete that fits that. I'm not going to mold it to the to, to any particular athlete. Right. So uh, that was the, and we had a couple of guys that went through it fine. Like I never understood like guys would be no problem, and here I am, you know, I'm dragging my ass trying to get through. Plus, I, I mean, I had come from football, so yeah, uh, I was a little beat up going in. But that was his, that was the, the thing. Everybody did the same training. I don't know if he altered my training more than a couple of times in all the time I was there. And, he, and I think he told me to stop during a, a session, maybe once or twice. So it didn't matter if you make, miss, it just, you just go, you grind. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so like I said, just learn how to be, and I did, you wind up doing a lot more than you think you can. Yeah. But I don't know if that's best approach there's something interesting as you say that because it's definitely not the first time i've heard this and i think chad too where where these people will will tell us about the training they did even what i did and what chad did when he was young i'm sure what you did like yeah. like <laughs> adam nelson may be one of the most insane ones the like 10 sets of 10 on five exercises for a workout one awesome. workout yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all leg stuff right and and other things like squatting seven, eight, ten times a day, like maximum every single day. These like ridiculous wow. training programs that for sure are not the smartest way to pro approach no. training. But there's like some, maybe it's like that's the kind of training you should do if you're going to be a great coach. Because you're not going to be a great athlete out of it for some <laughs> of us. Right. But you get, you walk away with this perspective of like, well, okay. Like you could, you could do the shittiest version of a squat program ever and still squat 700 pounds. So right. there must well, Adam be. Adam Nelson was going to squat 700 pounds if he did, right. you know, aerobics. Right. Well, or anyone, like, it's like, you might find that like, yeah, the whole, 
the whole amount of training you can do, what you're, what you're, po- what's capable, what you or sorry, what's possible, what you're capable of, all these things kind of get, you know, maybe like a bigger perspective on on the whole thing. And at the same time, doing that crazy training and that ridiculousness might actually open you up for the ability to do more later. If you had never been right pushed into that kind of work capacity, you might not be able to tolerate. The, the, the loads necessary, you know, later on. You might not be able to do a double day of Sheko. Just, do, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. just do the program twice a day. Right, right. No, I, I did, you know, when I was young, when, as soon as I touched a barbell, I tried to push mm-hmm. myself. And I did, I don't know if you guys, you guys might be too young for this, but uh, Cybergenics. Hmm. So they had, it was basically a scam to sell these like, supplements that didn't work. But the workout, so it was positive and negative failure on everything. Yeah. So yeah. like you would squat to positive and negative failure. To concentric and, then, and eccentric. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you'd go. And then you pick yourself up out of the, the heap <laughs> that you were in and then do ver- and then do jumps. Oh, good lord. Plus, I mean, <laughs> but then but then what happened when you took the supplements? Well, of course, and you got all of a sudden <laughs> supplements being stronger. So I did stuff like that. I bought I mean that was one of the I saw the an advertising for strength, the strength shoes. You know, those platforms. Uh, Chad's, I did, I did Chad's got a great strength shoes program. I, yeah. I mean, I bought that. I didn't take them off. I wore them <laughs> everywhere. I just said, I want to jump higher. And I was being pulling tires and anything that I could do. Jumping, I could find like stuff. That, oh, I could think I could jump off that. And I would jump off stuff. <laughs> yeah, just, I, well, because I saw Stefan Furlholm. Uh, the, he's the biggest, stronger, faster like poster yeah, yeah. boy. Uh, and he's like a, he was like a... Swedish or something. He was I, a th- yeah, thrower. I remember the, the posters of him hanging up in the in the high school. So he would uh, do. I, I sort of like I saw an article of him doing a depth jump off like this high wall. And, oh my god! Because I wanted to look like him. He looked like an athlete, you know. Yeah. And I, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do. I mean, I just put my body through oh, yeah. everything. <laughs> I, I was big j- jump soles with like an equivalent of strength shoes are yep. the ones that I used. And yeah, you know, I was a junior or senior in high school. I was over 250 pounds, <laughs> and those are hundreds of contacts of like high intensity stuff every day and i'm surprised that i have achilles left, <laughs> but uh I, I, don't, I don't think i'd last a day on them now but uh so the 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 point i want to dive deeper in you, you know you mentioned this uh, the bulgarian tour and like learning like uh, what they're doing but maybe right. they're not humans and that, that i think is is such an important understanding yeah. you know american weightlifting in my short time around it and and learning about it you know whether it's all right, let's bring in Dragomir, let's bring in Zygmunt, or, and, and not that those guys aren't good coaches or anything, but they're from different systems. And, and as the retroactive tests have, have shown, you know, that there's not everyone else is doing it, but, but everyone that it seems like, you know, the, the weightlifting pundits are like, well, we need to do more like Russian system or Bulgarian system or learn from the Chinese or learn from, from the Kazakhs or whatever. Uh, and, and you've gotten to spend time around, yeah. you know, Russian coaches, Cuban, you know, Chinese, all these different things. As, as you look at, at this learn, idea of learning from foreign systems, mm. where do you think the value is in that? And, and how do you think that Americans need to calibrate kind of for the, the information? It's a good question. And so I've, had, I've been fortunate to really sp- spend a lot of time with guys from other, from coaches from other countries and especially you know, in competitions, you get them a little oiled up and they start talking, you know, and it's really, the conversations have been great. But so the one thing, I, like the, I, I, I've thought about this a lot and, and uh, because we all want a system, right? We want to look at mm-hmm. it towards a system that, that works. But really the essence of any system is process. So the thing that all of these, guys, all of these countries have in common is they have a process, regardless of what it is. Right, you know, drugs, no drugs, ten times a day training, three times a week training. It doesn't matter. They do. They have a. They have a system that they follow, and it allows them to look at what works and doesn't work, and constantly try to improve and get rid of what doesn't work and add. So, forget it. Like people have to look. They got to see the forest, you know, through the through the trees. You know, you got to see why is it, why are they successful. It can't be drugs because every, almost every other country is taking drugs. So there's, there's a better and a worse among those countries. Mm-hmm. So uh, 
the the thing that they all do is they all do the same thing for them. And I think that before we start the conversation about what countries or what systems work best, it's not the system, it's the process. And I think that we have to, as coaches, I don't think the United States is going to develop its own process. Mm -hmm. uh, we're decentralized. It just, it's not, and you're not going to, I mean, we all know this, you're not going to get a room full of coaches to agree on anything. Well, it's kind of like, yeah, the, the, the letter I did three years ago now. Yes. Uh, open letter to USA Weightlifting yeah. talked about developing the, the American system in, in that. And, and that's what needs to be strived for, whether it's a pipe dream or not, is maybe a different, <laughs> a different discussion. But as we look at the, the changing landscape of international weightlifting, the drug tests are seemingly much more serious, mm -hmm. you know, and the, these countries are, are getting sanctions and, and everything. And, you know, maybe they just keep doing what they're doing and they, right. or they figure out a different way to beat the tests or, or something, but they don't tra change their training. The other option is they, they change the training in some way. And I think what we saw, you know, a lot with Dragomir and, and Zygmunt for his first couple of years was they brought the same system here and it and it didn't work, or no. the lifters just got too too beat up because it was it was too much for them, because you know they weren't they weren't on drugs and they right. couldn't they couldn't adapt the same way, you know with with something like the the Russian system, what what are adaptations that need to be made to the system to make it work for the drug free weightlifter? So I think you know the Russian system is a good baseline to look at because for a number of reasons first is they uh they use a variety of exercises you know i think that that can't be overlooked uh as far as its importance uh i think that there's a there's a sequential order in which uh things are added um i think that uh they're they have a good process for development like they're their development from years one through six is really good. Um, and I don't think we have to change actually that all too much. Um, I think it's the, the six, the five and six years on, or, or when I think you talk about once, once an athlete achieves a technical mastery, I think, you know, that, that process that the Russians use is really good. I think once they've reached mastery, how do you get them to, you know, to be international master sport type athlete. That's where I think there's a, there's the, the big difference has to, has to come. Mm -hmm. um, Would you think that even in that developmental system, uh, the developmental stage, um, you know, years one through six, uh, typically when, when in a biological age is one, year one through six right. happening for a, a Russian weightlifter, so does the time become compressed? Right. Or, and, and I want to get more into the kind of long-term development stuff stuff later but but continuing with this this current part of the the discussion um you know it, what what are the you know besides the the process and the creation of a, a system maybe some specifics that you've seen yeah absolutely from some of these different national systems the big difference that we that we face as opposed to other countries is when does an athlete insert themselves into weightlifting mm -hmm. right so you can have in in the russian system uh, that one through six you know, that, one, that first year is probably, what, 10, 11, 12 years old. That's not the case generally in the United States. So the concept of this, long, of this first one to six years is not really one to six years for us. Mm -hmm. So I think that you have to look at certain factors. Age, uh, is a, uh, size, um, uh, physical, uh, like physical education, background. I think if you get an older physically educated, well physically educated athlete that doesn't have any uh, movement limitations, they can, uh, that they can enter into that second phase that uh, going through that, that, that first one through six quickly mm -hmm. because their body is more conditioned to handle heavier loads. Um, their motor cortex is fully developed so they can learn things quickly uh, I think you still have to be careful about how f quickly you bring them through because being strong and being uh, durable for weightlifting are two very different things. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, they're, they're regardless of how talented the athlete is, 
how prepared, physically prepared they are, there still is a time period that you have to spend uh, hone, uh, stre strengthening their, their connective tissue, strengthening their joints uh, if, in order for them to handle the heavy cleaning jerks that uh, later down the road. Regardless of, of you can have a, you know, a gymnast that's a, a, a high-level gymnast say, I'm done with gymnastics, I want to come to you. I still think you have to spend time with them. So I think um, my parameter is in the switching from one phase to the next. I think the first phase is about technical mastery. The second phase is about strength. So the technical mastery phase ends when the mistakes that the athlete makes are not mistakes of poor concept uh, of technique, but it's it's mistakes that they're just not strong enough to hold position. Yeah. So that's when one phase ends and the next phase begins. Right. And how long that takes is a guess. But, you know, we talk about that one, that, that, that six years, it could be three, you know, depending upon if you get a, a mature athlete that has a good physical education and not any bad habits. That's the other mm -hmm. thing. You get a great athlete with, that's been taught wrong. Right. Now, now you have to, you're not going to get perfect technique out of them. You have to get consistent technique out of them. Do you so. think? Do you think the problem exists where we bet you, we 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 all agree that there's two distinct phases. One is this development of technical mastery. The other is essentially an emphasis on competition results. Right. And do you think that in the United States the problem is people don't have this? this concept that there's these two distinct phases to long-term development. And so it blends together where like we're going to develop technique and that in turn produces the competition results. Yeah. And so you get an athlete that comes in and it's like a, a short-term exploitation of their abilities produces great results initially, which, you know, satisfies posting on Instagram, <laughs> making medals, keeping them in the sport, getting everyone excited but then the long-term ramifications are that they didn't develop right. a foundation so that they can't succeed. So you end up with lots of, you know, flash in the pan athletes and, and, you know, potential talent that ends up, you know, making mistakes and errors that should have been eliminated years ago that now haunt them in the future. Absolutely. So it seems like that's our, our, that's our model, model right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think that, where we, like to me, the first step, the first phase of all of this is the ability to teach rational technique. Yeah. Right. And we fail miserably with that. So that's the first thing that has to happen. You know, they, you know that's it. Does well, nothing else matters. Why do you beginning. think, why do you think we, we struggle so much in that here? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things, so speaking with all these international coaches, these guys are professional coaches. They go to school to be a coach. Yeah. And then more specifically, they go to school to be a coach of weightlifting. I mean, we don't... I, I built that for myself. You know, I, I did all the science classes. I found somebody that... Know, I, I mentored under somebody that understood the science of, of lifting and, and coaching. And it was just this self-exploring for me. There was no... Class, there was no program that I can go to to right. learn this shit. But these guys, that's what they do. They go to school to learn how to be a coach. At first, you know, it's this big science uh, background that everybody takes, and then it's a specialization. Right. I mean, we don't have that. So we got guys that, that we bring all people that are doing this because it's something that they're passionate about. And we have passion. But we don't have skill, so I don't know how <clears throat> I don't know how to fix that because you can't. Well, I, I know what I would do um, would piss a lot of people off, but you know that's never really bothered me before. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just you know if you if you're really serious about developing coaches in a way to compete with other countries in a consistent basis. Because right now we have a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. So what happens if we don't have this talent? Then what happens? Are we developing anything? What's the process that we're using to continually develop 
this talent. So, like, for me, USAW, instead of spending their... We're spending resources on focusing on the people that we had already... Uh, we should take that back. We should be focusing on coaching development yeah. in a real way. Yeah. Because never mind the athletes so much. Just it's The coaches are the ones that are going to develop the talent. So if we don't have... We can do all the imp- increased numbers that we want. You know, we can open up the floodgates. If tomorrow, you know, soccer was banned and swimming was banned and gymnastics was banned and all these athletes are coming to USAW, what are we going to do with them? Max out every day. Right. Let's go. Max <laughs> out. Do it. So what I'm saying is, you know, <laughs> let's start now with a way, with a, with a, with, with a coaching development process. Yeah. And it doesn't mean like you, you don't, you and I don't do the same thing. Yeah. But there's, a, there's common threads. There's reasonable things that all coaches who are developing high-level athletes do. It might look a little different, but we can have a conversation about coaching, weightlifting, or coaching the snatch, coaching the clean and jerk, and we can agree on very important things. Yeah. How, how, many, how many of the, I feel like personally, the underpinnings of any coach... The underpinnings of coaching in general are understanding, obviously, communication and, and the, the, the social aspect of it, but understanding the principles of, of, the principles of training. Right. And I would be curious to know how many coaches, you grab 10 random coaches off the street or at nationals, could really sit down and, and maybe not be able to write down an excellent definition of every principle, but even understand that one, there are principles right. <laughs> and that there's underlying principles that exist. And those principles, you know, are saturate all training of every single sport and could say, Oh yeah, I can see how the principle of specificity applies to right. football, basketball, weightlifting, track and field. So I think like this like fundamental failure there or just sort of lack of knowledge there bleeds into everything that we do as coaches or the U.S. does as coaches. And, and to, that, to that same effect, you know, I see it in powerlifting and the way I've described it before is you, you get these, these great lifters, exceptionally talented lifters. And if, if you ask them to coach you and it's, you know, why just someone with a big total doesn't make a good coach, mm-hmm. they might understand their program, yes. yeah. but they don't understand programming right yeah Yeah, and an important distinction to be made there and i think is you know if if weightlifting coaches are are just regurgitating the the same program that they trained under or whatever without an understanding of of more of the why behind the what that they're that they're doing that it's going to become limited and and if they get an athlete who fits it right maybe that person becomes very very talented but i definitely agree with you on the on the coaching development side of things because an athlete maybe has, you know, two to eight year, you know, strong competitive career. But, you know, we, we got to sit down with Tim Swords uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago. And if you have a great coach like, like a Tim Swords type, he might may, maybe in the sport for 40 years. Right. You know, and how many yeah. <laughs> athletes yeah. could he bring to that high level within that 40 year career? Uh, so I do think that that's a big thing, and, and if I see somewhere, you know, where where USA weightlifting could do a, a definitely a better job, is educating the youth coaches and junior coaches. Yeah. Because yeah. Inf- information about the training of senior athletes is so much more prevalent. Right. And and all the when people talk about Russian system, Chinese system, Bulgarian system, they're talking about not the first one to six right. year yeah. phase. Six to 12. Yeah, it's the six to 12 year yeah. phase. Yeah. And if, if, the athlete, if the coaches who are working with the youth athletes and junior athletes don't understand that that is a, you know, a latter stage of things and try and apply it too early, that's, I think, what really hamstrings the long-term pro- progress is, is that lack of the early developmental stage. I agree. So as, as we look at long-term development for the athlete, um, and, and where it's tough, you know, where it's, it's more complex for the American lifter, mm-hmm. is you get some people who start when they're 12, and you get some people who start when they're 22, and both of them have been very you know, successful 
relative uh, to, to the American lifters. You know, Morgan King going to the Olympics, and she started at, what, 26 or right. 27. Um, you know, if, if you look at those, those two cases, someone coming into the sport as a, as a youth, someone coming in as a senior athlete with whatever sport background they have, and I know there's a lot of variables here, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what, what's the first thing to focus on? Technical development. Technical, it's yeah. always going to be technical development. Right. Because that's what everything is built on. So, and, and I mentioned this before. I so, said, you know, if you get somebody that doesn't, that has bad habits or limitations that aren't going to get fixed, then you have to develop a stable technique. You know, yeah. with somebody that, that is younger and has none of these problems, then you look at, like, you know, what's the rational technique for weightlifting? So, rational technique might not be. Uh, Rational technique is stable, but stable technique might not be rational technique. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just this kind of weird thing. So once you develop a consistency, then you can, and and that's when you can kind of, that's the first step, whatever that looks like. Um, And understand that if they're, if it's, if it's a stable technique, but not, perfect then you're gonna have limitations you don't know what those limitations are until you get there uh because at some point biomechanics is gonna bite you in the ass you know if you have somebody that that can't straighten their arms uh and overhead it's gonna be difficult for them to hold jerks overhead at some point you know and it's because they because they just don't have the good position so that's that's actually really interesting because that's something that i've so what you are you're saying that two different athletes you take you have two different roads, basically. You have an athlete who's a beginner that comes in. You're going to teach them an ideal technique that models or mimics the model of, of, of you know, let's say the most efficient, excellent yes. technique that you would pick from a model that was developed based on biomechanics yes. and, and logic. Absolutely. Another athlete comes in, maybe already has some training under their belt or, or athletic career under their belt. They are more advanced in age. They're going to need, it's going to be more difficult to change the technique they have. It might have some flaws that are not modeled in, that are, right. don't, don't mimic the model you have, but you can stabilize the technique so it's, it's yes. repeatable and safe, and you'll go with what that is. And then the goal is, well, let's, let's achieve what we can physically out of this person. So you would say those are two different paths you, you have to follow as a, as a coach yes i mean and, and you know to use myself as an example when i came into the con i was like 23 or 24 right. really good athlete i mean over 10 foot vertical ju- uh, a broad jump you know over 35 inch vertical so i mean i was already a good athlete yeah but i was 24 right you know we don't have time to fuck yes. around yeah so that's part of the reason why he kind of threw me into the mix because uh, he figured i was a good enough athlete i'll pick it up and I'll be able to withstand it. So, like, if you have, you know, time is a factor, too. Because yeah. this shit takes time. You know, yeah. you have a lot of time when someone's 12 to get to, to, to hold their hand and get them through. But if you have an athlete that's 25, 26 years old, I mean, you got to get them stable. And yes. you got to go. Because you, you'll have maybe one chance. Yeah, it's like you, you don't have yeah. time to yeah. necessarily do what is optimal... Right. You know, all things like uh, optimal with everything else being equal, you have to do what's optimal for the, the actual situation. And if you have someone who's, you know, has four year, you know, a potential four year career. Right. What are you going to do? Yeah. You have yeah. to. You spend four years potential. like perfecting. Yeah. yeah it's you, just not going to happen. And, 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 straight but, arms, but you only clean 90 kilos. Right. Yeah. So, and, like, other countries don't deal with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're 24 years old, they'll, you don't even have a chance. Yeah. So, you know, the, this is where U.S., I think, is ahead of the game in a sense of, you know, we're going to be, we're, I think, in this next couple of quads, we're going to have athletes that didn't start until late that are going to be medal contenders. So You once told me uh, a, a story about a, a Russian coach telling you that oh, yeah. you, you had asked him, hey, like, what, what's the progression for teaching snatch in Russia? And, and, you know, this is really common in the U.S., this idea of, like, here's our snatch technique model. Here's, here's our progression. And part of that probably comes from, you know, capitalism. We, you know, we have sure. to sell a, you know, you're selling a product, so you create a, a system for teaching it. And, and I think it's a good thing to have a uniform structure to, yes. like, hey, here's you do it. 
What was what did he tell you that they do in Russia? What is the the progression for teaching in Russia? I forgot. Uh, well, I remember I remember you said he was like we don't they just they every kid in Russia knows what a snatch is when right. they come into okay. the gym. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a different the entry into weightlifting is just different in the United States than any, than anywhere else. Yeah. It's just well, it's like, it's like, you know, in America, baseball or basketball, yeah. you know, I, I think I probably started playing basketball in a little rec league or whatever. I was six or seven years old, but I'd been playing in my driveway before that. Right. Yep. And the first time I shot a basketball, you know, it's, it's not like I just grabbed this basketball and, and looked at the basket <laughs> like, how, how does it go from here to there? Yeah, yeah. You know, I had, I had seen ESPN, I'd seen Michael Jordan, yeah. I'd seen, right. and, and you could recreate it to some degree and you'd seen people yeah. swing a baseball bat and maybe you didn't do it perfectly right yeah. but it, it's like all right that's some facsimile of what we're going to try and do now let's tweak it and tweak it and tweak it where you know people hadn't seen a snatch till they were 22 you know yeah. you kind of <laughs> and the the people who are talented and have the aptitude for it they're going to be able to see it happen and make it look like okay that is a snatch maybe not a very good right. one but but we we got something to work with. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned you know quads and in America over the next the next several quads and and the idea of the quad the quadrennial the four year training plan the Olympic period, um, I think doesn't get maybe doesn't get enough attention in the long t- in in the planning people for not, for people lifters. People are thinking about next week. Yeah, <laughs> and and some of it I think is is problematic, or is is. It's a symptom of the way that qualifying for international teams works here. You know, you, you can't have an Ilya Ilya situation where he's like, okay, I'm just not going to compete for this year. And right. we had one guy do that, Kendrick Ferris did, and he went to three Olympics, you know, through this yeah. longer development plan. But if if a coach is, is trying to plan long-term for their athlete, you know, a year at a time, four years at a time, what are some early considerations in that versus, you know, when it really counts considerations. You're talking about like more high level athletes? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the most important thing, which is what this part of it drives me crazy, and it's not USAW's fault, um, is what's the four year competition schedule? You know, when are the major competitions? That to me is the first thing you have to identify. Uh, and then which of those competitions are important that you have to be able, you have to be in peak shape? Um, like for athletes that were already had already put up a big total at Worlds for us, Pan Am's wasn't yeah. that important because they're already had, they're already going to be on the World Team for next year. Mm-hmm. So then you know the, the training would reflect that it wouldn't be a major peak. So you have to well, I mean, Worlds last year doesn't count for Worlds qualifying. Does does that change? Does it? Yeah. <laughs> well, Are you sure. According to the new calendar. Oh, <laughs> right. It did prior. It did yeah. prior, but it, did, prior it years, doesn't, yeah. doesn't yeah. this year. Right, this time, sorry. Yeah. But, uh, right, so I, that, let's scratch that. <laughs> so, uh, I, forgot, I forgot the new weight classes are, are, are After are you Photoshop those bicep veins, and you know why. <laughs> but uh, I think identifying the major competitions are the first thing you have to do. And then you have to see what are the initially you know what are the problems we have to solve right away like, how do we get we're here we need to we want to get here you know what do we have to do what are the what's the big picture stuff that we have to do we have to what's the total and then we say okay how do we what do we need to do to get to that total so what are the things that are that are that are the barriers in our way that are preventing us from getting there and then you start to kind of peel back these layers well it's you know, the, the snatch is low. Okay, well, then how do we, what are, the, what are the milestones that we have to reach in order to get there? So we have this long-term, I mean, it's like anything with, with planning. We have this long-term goal. We know what the destinations are that we have to go to. And then we have to know what are the, what are the things that we have to bring with us to those destinations. And that's really the, as far as, you know, the 5,000-foot view, that's what we're looking at, at doing. And, uh you know, you 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 plan it as if it's a perfect situation without injury, without life, yeah. shit getting in your way, which we all know that doesn't ever happen. Mm-hmm. But we have to have an idealized model first, 
And then from that idealized model, the one thing that we do know, regardless of what bullshit happens in between, we know where we do definitely know what we have to do to get to where we have to go. So within that, within those periods of time, if shit happens, then on the fly, we got to figure out how do we, what alterations do we have to make in order to stay on track? Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes this constant influx. It's like, a, it's like, it's, it's really, it's like a biological organism because it's constantly, uh, it's constantly affected by its external stress. And I think that that's where the understanding of principle becomes so right. important because if, if you just have this very rigid plan and when something inevitably goes wrong in it, if you don't understand the why behind that plan or you can't contextualize that you're going to, you know, this adjustment I make, yeah, maybe I have to give up a little bit of specificity for extra variation because they're getting stale or, right. or is this injury workaround or whatever, it makes it very difficult to, to make those decisions. And I think this is something that, that definitely exists in the, in the long term for the athletes as well as the shorter term. And you know, what I'd encourage coaches and, and lifters to do there, if you work with, with youth athletes, and, and this is the one that, that is more like sensitive to mm -hmm. me because I, I don't want to see a, a youth athlete go down a path that, that, or their coach take them down a path that they think is good in the time because they're getting these good quick results and actually end up limiting their long-term potential is that if you work with a 13-year-old lifter, a 13-year-old athlete in any sport, your concern cannot be, I'm. What do I do to become the best thirteen-year-old? Right. Yeah. It is what can I do at thirteen to set me up for becoming the best twenty-three-year-old? That's exactly yes. right. Yeah. yeah. Or if you're, you know, you've been weightlifting for a year or two years. It's it's not necessarily how how can I, you know, make the biggest total possible at American Open Series one. Right. You know, it's it's how can my training for American Open Series one help me lift more yeah. at American Open Championships right. at the at the end of the year, and I think that's where it, it gets lost is people are thinking in in eight weeks and twelve weeks and sixteen weeks at a time, you know, just how can I make the biggest results at this next meet, not not with the context of some some stuff is more important than right. others, some yeah. meets are more important than others, and you can't. If you're trying to always peak or you're trying to always have your best meet ever, you know, once you have some appreciable qualification, it just can't happen like that. Or instead of the peak being, you know, instead of getting to have one or two meets a year up here, now you have three or four or five meets a little bit a little bit lower. That's exactly right. It's 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 that it's the you know, one eye on what's going on right now and, and responding and reacting to that, but the other eye's gotta be in what's the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. And then what decisions we make to get there are, you know, part art and part science, you know, it's, it's, and it's, uh, it, getting an athlete to that point is nothing short of a miracle. Yeah. And it's when, when, the, when you gotta, when there's so many qualifying meets mm -hmm. and there's, and there's stipends and, and all this different shit, it makes it, it, it makes it very cloudy and complicated, I think, to create that long-term plan. But when you, you mentioned in there art and science and something I, th I think that you're well known for is you provide this this on your website and I think really gets to that uh, issue of, of the art versus the science of coaching is the, the idea of lifting ratios. Yes. And comparing the different exercises in, in this, you know, Vitruvian man type of uh, <laughs> idyllic proportion. Can you talk about, you know, what the you know, what they are, how you use yeah. them, how people can apply them. So this is, this is a big part of my process, right? So I, I look at the relationship uh, between the snatch of clean and jerk and all the other lifts. So we have, we have it's about 12 lifts or so that I look at for the clean and jerk, uh, supplemental exercises, uh, lifts from boxes, lifts from the hang, uh, press and all these different exercises. And the snatch is, I think, uh, five or six exercises that I feel are the most impactful for uh, for improving and developing the snatch in a clean and jerk. So, but before we get into that, not to cut you off too no much, problem. But for the th so these other ones would be defined as special exercises. Special exercise. Correct. Anything that's not a snatch or clean and jerk yes. is a special exercise. So, to prove a point to 
powerlifters who probably don't actually listen to this podcast because <laughs> they, they hate me. You said five or six exercises for the snatch. Can yeah. you tell us what those exercises yeah, are? Yeah, off the top of my head, uh, overhead squat, uh, snatch from the blocks above the knee, uh, hang snatch from below the knee. Um, there's a, I think there's a, there's some kind of like a snatch grip, snatch push grip press. press or something like that. Um, I think those are the, the, the general ones. Uh, there might be, oh, snatch from the block below the knee, which I'm not sure has a strong correlation. I'm still deciding that it's great training exercise to mm, do yeah. some of the stress on the back and the legs, but I don't know if it correlates well to performance in the competition. So, to, to make my somewhat sarcastic <laughs> point here, you're concerned that snatch from blo- blocks below the knee may not have a high enough transfer to training. Right. So that's the type of scope we're talking about when defining a special exercise. Yes. You know who I'm talking to. <laughs> okay? That the most dissimilar exercises there was like an overhead squat was as far away as we were getting. That's what special exercises actually are. <laughs> I'm glad I can help you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Continue. So we have the, the your snatch exercise, your clean and jerk yeah. exercises. And so, and including in those exercises, back squat, front squat, obviously. And so I look at what these exercises are, and that tells me either where the weakness is and, and, where, and, and where we need to concentrate the training. So how I use this also is, you know, I use strength as a driver for the cleaning jerk. So I don't try to push the cleaning jerk until the squat is, uh, has enough, uh, is a higher enough uh, above the cleaning jerk in order to push. Because I think that to me, back squat between 120, 130% of the cleaning jerk is an, is ample strength to be able to recover and not to beat the shit, not always app or operating on the red line. So if your squat is, let's say, 150% of your clean and jerk, well, that tells me the focus doesn't have to be on improving leg strength. We can focus more energy on development of, tech, of, 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 of special strength um, in different positions. Uh, Once I get that, like, 370 kilo clean. Yeah, but you, <laughs> right. <laughs> 370 uh, clean uh, coming up. My, my ratios are off. My the ratios, ratios are a little are off. off. But it's 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 a it's a it's a way for us to determine the concentration of the training and identify where the weaknesses are. Uh, so, and it's also a way to predict what performance can be. So I have a formula that I use that would put plug these exercises into a formula, and it'll give me an i just an idea of what they what they if in a perfect world, you know, if you can unscrew their head, mm-hmm. what they're per, what they're capable of of lifting on uh, in competition. So it's a predictive tool as well. Uh, as a, uh, a way to determine the focus and concentration of training. So you would say, correct me if I'm wrong, but your, your basic approach, which mimics a lot of what the Soviets kind of created, yeah. is, is you in, start out with an initial amount of stress, let's say, and that stress is equal to a certain total volume of training, right? right? And of this 100% volume, you can look at all these exercises and say, okay, your squats are really, really close to your clean and jerk. You're only at 105%. Right. You know, so we'll take some of that 100% volume and shift it yes. into squatting and pull it away from clean and jerks and other things that are, are not as necessary. So we're going to shift some of that volume to that rather than say, you know, we're not changing anything. I'm just going to add squats and, and stuff. Right. This is, this is where the long-term planning comes in. Because right. if you have, if this is the problem that you're, that you're dealing with, like 105%, so we say there's a, there's a definite uh, strength deficit here that we need to focus on. The biggest competition we have to do is is down here is you know 12 months away we'll say. Uh, so you obviously when you're reaching uh, two three months before the for that major competition you can't the focus can't be on improving leg strength. So the 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 key is to to how do we develop when do we focus primarily on the leg strength? Then how do we maintain what the, the things that we've developed early on without taking away from the, the 
technical uh, element of the training that's required as we get closer to a major competition. So this is where I think the difference in how we program from maybe other systems that use uh, vitamins to help comes into play. So I think that the maintenance of this, and the biggest problem especially with, with a more advanced lifters, is how do we maintain their strength without beating the shit out of them with strength? Uh, drugs are great for that because you don't have to, once you develop that strength, you can maintain that strength without killing yourself with strength. Right. So how do we do that in drug-free athletes is really where the art and, and, well, and science is. So a lot of that probably stems from the, the, the system, right? So right. If, you're, if your long-term system is initially develop technical mastery, stabilize that technique, yes. and create an athlete that's, that's able to resist technical decay yes. during periods of very intense training, you've now maximized the situation for the athlete to then, let's say, be very advanced, and they can spend more energy and time developing and maintaining yes. strength because their skill doesn't decay during that period of time, one hundred percent. Then you end up with you know a top level performer. Right. The or, problem is that when you come mash it all together and and just beat somebody to shit for twelve weeks, they PR by ten kilos. They go to meet. It's awesome. There's nothing after that. Right. Uh, it's kind of something like uh, Ilya and Vasily and Klokov had said at the seminar at, at your gym several years back. It was like. You know, that, that they started lifting at whatever young age, Ilya, six years old, you know, and it was like he said when he was 13, or I don't remember which one of them yeah. said this, but kind of the technique he had when he was 13, it was his right. technique, and then yeah. then I just tried to get strong as shit, you right. know, to, yeah. to paraphrase. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, it's unconscious. They can roll out of bed and perform the snatch that they're going to perform, right. whether it's in front of their bed or on the Olympic stage. That was That's what it's going to be. Yeah. Once you get to that point, and then we talk, that's the second phase is yeah. how do we get strong enough to hold these positions and strong enough to have a reserve to where our power isn't affected, you know, it, it, our, our power production isn't isn't affected. So it's two. It's it's the ability to hold position and it's the ability to have the to to be able to produce this the requisite amount of power. It's not as much power as you have to. There's a there's a threshold. For every for every weight there, you, you, uh, for every amount of weight on the bar, there's a requisite amount of power that you need to produce. How do we maintain that? And that's uh, that's really the 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 nuts and bolts of developing a weightlifter. You know, it's figuring that out. Do you think that w the the underlying principle of your ratios is really a representation of like? like something like the explosive strength deficit where where really what the ratios indicate is how much where where they are on that force velocity curve mm -hmm. like if you have these huge amounts of strength 150 160% squat to clean and jerk ratio you're really far to that side yes and but improving strength and moving further up that that force curve is not going to bring this the velocity up at all it's not and so you end up with this really the ratios are giving you an example of like look you need to bring all these things closer together and try to move them up slowly yes. you know so like the the principle of ratios is not so much grounded in the usefulness of the ratio is not so much grounded in the exact number of it. No. It's the relationship yes. between things and what that means from a, a motor quality perspective. That's right. It's, you're exactly right. It's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be used as a strict guideline. It's a, it's, a, it's a peek into where you probably should concentrate your, your energy. Right. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's a way it's it's like i said it's my process yeah you know it's a something i can always look towards as you know this is the way that this is the way that i conceptualize development and i do the, I, I take the same approach to everybody and we see what works I mean, some people as you know they you know they put five kilos on their back squat their clean jerk goes up five kilos yeah some people you put 100 kilos on their back squat and their clean jerk goes down so <laughs> yeah. like you know where do you so how do you fix that problem you know, the ratio isn't going to tell you how to do it, but it's going to give you some, it's going to, it's going to give you information 
on, uh, and then it's up to you to figure out a process that, because then you have to know your athlete. Right. So yeah. each athlete's going to be different. Yeah, at least you know what target you're shooting at. at least right. Then. Everybody's yeah. shooting at the same target. You know, <laughs> how are you going to get there? What yeah. gun are you going to use? The, uh, so what, what would be some suggestions you have for coaches and athletes listening to, uh, to better you know, educate themselves and to some of these ideas? I said before, learn technique. Just learn what the snatch and clean and jerk is and figure out a way to make it look like, you know, look at some of the best lifters and that's your model, right? So not like the ones that are doing weird shit. But you know Tatiana, Quo, you know some of these, uh, some of these really like technically you would look at just beautiful lifting. Look at that and say, how do I get there? So whenever you look at your athlete moving, you have this picture in one side of your brain about Tatiana, and you look at your athlete, and then you say, how do I? What do I need to do to get my athlete closer to that? So if you can, if, if coaches can figure that out, we'd be much further along. Because right now, all this programming stuff, I love it. It's great. It doesn't mean shit mm. if somebody can't snatch a clean and jerk. So, you know, to me, don't, like, you can follow any, like, you buy one of those Russian training manuals. They have those first, like, six years programming in there. Do that. You know, you can't go wrong. But just teach a kid how to lift weights. Because it's, breaks my heart. Like, you see these talented kids. I saw a kid... At, I don't know what I'd ever meet the nationals from Florida. Uh, he was a seventy-seven. He moved. He looked like he was a. He looked like a black Blagojev. That's what he looked like. He moved onto the bar as fast as I've ever seen any human being move onto the bar, and he couldn't lift. Like, he couldn't lift. So I don't. And I, I know the coach, and the coach's a good dude. Um, but you get a kid like that, you gotta figure it out. You gotta, you gotta teach that kid good technique. This kid can be a champion. So I got, my point being is just figure out how to, and I don't know how you do it. Like, I don't know how, I learned technique because I spent my whole freaking life learning it. There's gotta be a better way. Like, I don't know what that way is. Um, but uh, but you definitely, you're seeing it much more America as a whole, to paint, paint with a broad brush, much more a failure of the developing technical prowess versus the not getting strong enough after that has happened. Yeah, I mean, the strong enough is, that's, uh, to me, that's the easy part. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, not, it's not rocket science to be strong enough. It's, it's how do you use that? How do you, and if you don't have the foundation, so for instance, you know, if you have, uh, if you're strong enough, but you can't lift weights, who gives a shit? So it, it just, I don't know how to solve that problem. Look, I love teaching courses and you know, I do USAWs, I do my own. I love it. It's great. Um, but it's not, I'm not, it's, it's a good start. Like for me, I go to the, if I go to a seminar or, or, or talk to somebody, like to me, it's not that I'm learning something, everything about the thing that I'm, I'm going, I'm going to, to, to learn about it's I can now I have some questions that I can ask it opens up like you start peeling back the layers of the onion because if you can have if you come out of these courses with one question that opens up other questions like that to me is the process that somebody needs to use um, but I don't we're not doing it I mean I guess I mean, would you say that, te- that technically people are getting better at the national meets it's hard to say. It is hard I, to say. I would say that I would say that what I've seen in the U.S. is that before, because there's all things came at once. Before we didn't have the level of talent we have now. Right. So you didn't have people walking in. I mean, there's people that walk into weightlifting now that would have been like legendary. Fifteen right. years ago, we'd be like, "Who is this girl? Who's that? Like, this destroying it." Whereas, so like that that level of talent coming in might overshadow the fact that. You know, we haven't learned or improved as coaches. But I also say that there's a lot of good coaches or people that are exhibiting really good qualities in that they, they're they teaching better technical, you know, but why coaching are they teaching better, better technical. technical? What are they doing? 
I think there's just so much more information out there. Okay. When I started lifting, and, and when you know, probably you, like when I started lifting, no one could explain what technique was what you were supposed to do. Right. Like you watch, I taught myself at a snatch watching, looking at pictures and watching videos, and it was like, I didn't understand what I was watching. I, I tried really hard, right. but like no one could definitively answer questions I had, like, well, what's supposed to happen here? What am I supposed to do with this and that? It was all just, yeah, like just grab the bar and like you kind of do what that guy does on the video and like, you know, and that was it. So I think there's definitely a huge influx of people grasping the concepts better. I think it's more a matter of like, like you talk about the process. I, I equate it to the idea of like, like a, 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 a carpenter or something. It's a, it's being a coach is very much like a trade skill. Yes. It's, it's not just the fact that you know how to build something or build a house or whatever. It's that what is the level of craftsmanship you apply to that? Everybody can come in and build a table, but the truly great coaches are going to come in and do something that, that is a table like everything else. But the level and the quality of what it, what their product is, is for superior to somebody else. And I think that's where you're going to find that's where you, I don't know if we have that yet. We have a lot of coaches that, yeah, they can make a table that's square. They can make an right. athlete that does snatch and clean and jerk better than it was 10 years ago. But are we producing the, the Tatianas here and we have 15, 20 coaches that can do that? Or do we have, you know, we're kind of in that, that range. We're like, yeah, we're getting close, but we're not, we don't have people that are like. And, and is the issue getting clouded in some situations of, exceptional talents yes. doing things wrong but still having a great result yeah. but you can see that yeah. right well, so you can go you can look at somebody on the stage we can see that yeah oh, okay <laughs> we can see that yeah but you have somebody on a stage that's lifting see i i to me you know when i people would ask me about strength and conditioning coaches right so this is uh, this is a uh, uh this is appropriate for this conversation so I got, uh, <laughs> when, we'll, when we'll Waxman see. has to preface that, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, so somebody asked, I, asked me, how do you determine what a good strength and conditioning coach is? Because the idea isn't about, you know, the weights are a tool. It's right. not like the, so I said, you know, when I go into a weight room, like, a, like these big college weight rooms, I don't really give a shit about the board, the record board. To me, that is the most useless piece I understand what the use is for, yeah. but it's not to determine the quality of the coach. I walk into the room and I want to see how everybody's moving. Like if you're teach, if you're if people are squatting, it better damn well look like a fucking squat, and not a, 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 a Louis Simmons good morning. You know, it, he it, said it, not me. I'm sorry, guys. Special exercise. Special exercise. <laughs> um, you know, if guys are doing power cleans, very special. <laughs> It's got to look, I mean, if you're developing power with a power clean, then it's got to look like a power clean or else it's not doing the thing that you want it to do. So the quality of the movement to me is, is the indication of the quality of the coach. Because if you have talented athletes that are moving well, they're going to maximize their uh, development with good technical lifts. They're going to they're extract everything that's positive from the thing that you're giving them if they're doing it correctly. Like the, the high result then becomes a, a byproduct. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, Bonnerchuk talks about strong enough. These exercises have to be done. This is the range that, that's most effective to, to improve the re result in the throws. Well, be, the, move, the quality of the movement is the thing that's going to that's gonna tell us if the coach knows what to do. Because the athlete is a representation of the coach. You know, it's the product. It's what we produce. So, like, we don't make pants. We don't make coffee. We make athletes. So, if the coffee tastes like shit, uh, it might be hot and it kind of is coffee. But yeah. if it tastes like shit, it's shit. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe don't judge it on the best cup of coffee you ever made. Right. Nor the worst cup of coffee yeah. ever made. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, because everyone can have it can get lucky you know, right. once in a while. But, well, you uh, know, if I have a cup of coffee and it tastes like Hawaiian punch, it's not, it's, it's just it's a different thing. <laughs> I don't know. Sounds like you, delicious yeah. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this was uh, the Jug Life podcast. 
You can find it on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and thejuglife.com. We really appreciate when you go on there, give us a five-star review on iTunes, write us something funny or nice, and help more people find the show because those ratings and uh, and reviews help our iTunes ranking. Um, you know, if you're interested in online coaching from Juggernaut, powerlifting, weightlifting, super total, strongman, and power building. You can check that out at juggernautcoaching.com. We have all different levels from beginner to advanced athletes, as well as all sorts of books by myself, Max, Marissa, Dr. Mike Isretel. Uh, a lot of smart people that can help you understand these principles, understand how to program and, and train better and coach better. Um, subscribe to the YouTube. Three plus videos per week from the world's strongest videographer, Shorty Sedang. <laughs> and uh, I don't know when this one's going to come out, so I can't tell you about any events necessarily. But check the events section at store.jtsstrength.com. Sean, where can people fi uh, find you, follow you, learn more about Waxman's Gym? Waxman'sGym.com on the internet. Uh, the Facebook is Waxman's Gym, Instagram, Waxman's Gym. Uh, I think that's all our uh, electronic uh, reach. Do you, have, um, do you have a separate uh, Fat Elvis Instagram or? No, no, no. I have. <laughs> I do not. I have my own Instagram, but don't go there. It's nothing. There's only pictures of my dog. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty a, much that's it. That's at Penn Glen Life. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram, Max underscore Ada, on Facebook, Max Ada, or email me, Max at JTSStrength.com. And I'm Chad Wesley Smith at Chad Wesley Smith and at Juggernaut Training on Facebook and Instagram. This was The Jug Life. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.